All right, now joined by none other than new North Carolina head coach, Hubert Davis. Uh, Hubert, I, I know you've heard it said plenty by now, uh, but head coach at North Carolina, did yeah. you ever think this was going to happen? If I had told you this when you were playing uh, years and years ago, what no. would you have said? No, the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. But, you know, um, I've been asked that, that question a lot. And, you know, it's a pretty cool deal from the standpoint of, you know, I had always wanted to be a part of this program. I had always wanted to go here even when I was a little kid. And, you know, my uncle Walter Davis was an All-American here in the mid-70s. And that's where I fell in love with this place. I had dreamed of running through that tunnel, putting on that uniform and playing on that floor. And, you know, to think that I had the opportunity to play here, get an education and graduate here, uh, and then be able to come back and be an assistant coach for nine years with the greatest coach that I've ever been around and Coach Williams. And then now for the last six and a half months, now I'm the head coach of the University of North Carolina. Uh, it puts you in a place of humbleness, thankfulness, and it's a great place to be. So is is Coach Williams' golf game a little bit better now? He's got more time well, he's been out there? Game, his golf game is better. His tan is better. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> he's not as tired anymore. He looks great. <laughs> and, and now you're getting a little more gray as now we go already? Now my golf game is down, and uh, I'm getting gray, and I look tired. <laughs> well, how did you learn? Yeah. that Roy was going to step down and, and, and kind of what was your reaction? Well, you know, over the last three or four years, there's been a couple of occasions when Coach Williams and I, it was just us two recruiting, and he would say, you know, I'm getting close. And he says, do you have any interest? Because I'd like you to be the next head coach. And my response to him every time that he said that was either silence or, Coach, you know, I, I really like where I'm at. Um, I, I'm, I'm settled and I love being one of your assistants. And so that was my response each time that he brought it up. But uh, we played Duke the last regular season game last year on Saturday. On Sunday, he asked me and my wife to come over to his house. We couldn't do it. My youngest son had a soccer tournament in Richmond, so she couldn't get back in time. So we went over there on Monday. That's when he told us that he was going to retire. And uh, he said he wanted me to be the next head coach and uh, my response was the same and there was lots of uh, communication emotions crying and um, we, we talked for over two hours with coach Williams and Mrs. Williams and then we went through the ACC tournament and NCAA tournament we didn't say anything to each other and I, I didn't I, I really felt like that we had a chance to win the ACC tournament and I felt like if we got the right draw we could get on a roll in the NCAA tournament. So I wanted our focus to be on that. And I didn't want to talk about, you know, coach retiring. But after we lost to Wisconsin, the next day when we landed, he says, I need you to come over to the house. And so my wife and I went back over to the house and he says, I was serious. I'm going to, I'm going to retire. Will you be the next head coach? And that's when I said, I would love to. And uh, started the process of, uh, you know, um, Bubba and uh, the chancellor going through a national search and three or four days later, I was officially named the head coach. So it, 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 it was a long process. I had known that coach was going to retire for three, three weeks to a month before he actually did it. And I was the only one that knew. And so it was, it was an emotional time. And, um, um, but that's how it all happened. <laughs> I was going to say, at least we, we know you can keep a secret. Right? I, can't. <laughs> I mean, we know that I can now. I can keep it. That's one thing I can do. <laughs> exactly. I mean, come on. That, that's pretty impressive. That's it pretty is. Impressive. It really is. It really All is. Right, so, Roy, I remember talking to him a couple of years ago at the Combine, and the transfer portal had just kind of started at yeah. that point, and he was so frustrated. He hated it. I mean, he <laughs> hated it. You could tell. Like, he, he, he believed that, like, Carolina, the family, what it meant, you know, guys didn't leave. Guys never had left Carolina for years. And, you know, you come in and this thing is just, it's motoring now, the, the portal. I mean, everybody's taking transfers. You, you have no choice. You did well. You did well in the portal. Um, how hard was it to kind of go that route? Because you knew Carolina, that's not what it's been about for, for years, forever. No, no, it isn't. And people say, you know, it's transfer portal. It's not, it's, it's free agency. That, I mean, that's what it is. And, you know, it, it's, it's a part of college basketball now. 
You know, kids, if they have just a little bit slight adversity, um, that they're either, if they have a great year, they're going to the NBA. If they don't have the year that they want to, they're, they're going to transfer. <laughs> and so that's the reality of college basketball. Um, you know, you know, Jeff, we had to uh, dip into the transfer portal. You know, when I took over the team, we only had nine players and, and really on, only one big in Armando Baycott. So we had no choice to do that. Um, what we did in the transfer portal wasn't good. It was great. We, we got three, like, great, unbelievable players. If, if we can do this in a transfer portal every year, then I'm all for it. This is great. I mean, because you just, yeah. you know, to get three guys from power conferences and Justin McCoy, who's had a number of experience playing at Virginia, Brady Manick is the best shooting big in the country. I mean, he is, he's unbelievable. He's a four-year starter at Oklahoma. And so to have him and then towards the end of the summer get Darson Garcia, who we recruited out of high school, but he was the best freshman in the Big East. And so to get those three bigs, versatile bigs, the, the type of bigs that I want to play and I want to coach and get them off the transfer portal. And I really think they're Carolina kids, Jeff. You know, you know, we we, we want guys that have both feet in and that um that want to be here, want to be a part of this history, want to be a part of this program. And in Justin and Brady and in Dawson, we got three transfers that are Carolina guys. And they're different. You know, they're, they're different. different. And, and well, that's, they're they're yeah, much that's different than the bigs that we had last year, you know, and, and, you know, Garrison Brooks, unbelievable player, Dayron Sharp, uh, Walker Kessler, all of them were unbelievable but, you know, you saw us offensively. It struggled. We, you know, we had two big guys on, on, on the post, and we just – there was no spacing. And I've always liked versatile bigs um, that can play on the perimeter and make plays and handle the basketball, and, and our bigs can do that now. Yeah, there was the one area where Roy was pretty steadfast, wasn't it? He liked those two traditional bigs. If yeah. You get them. yeah. Yeah. And you're going to play differently, aren't you? I mean, no secret, you're going to play a little bit differently because – and again, the game's changed to where you need those versatile bigs. You know, you do. You know, one of the things that I tell the team every day, whether we are in transition, secondary break, uh, a half court set, our offense is bound by spacing, balance, and movement. You just you just have to have that. And so I want our guys to be able to have the space to be able to use all their gifts and talents out there on the floor. And so um, our bigs, they get the rebound. I want them bringing the ball up the floor. I want Dawson and Brady and, and Justin coming off ball screens and down screens and shooting threes and driving from the perimeter. But um, also the thing that I love about um, our bigs is not only are they versatile on the offensive end, like we can switch all ball screens. I mean, like Dawson is an elite on ball defender. Like if he switches off to a point guard, I mean, I'm just always saying Dawson's got him. Dawson's got him. And so, we have that ability on both ends of the floor. All right. So as good as your bigs are going to be, which they are, I mean, they're yeah. all different. They can complement each other. Yeah. It's still a guards game. You know that you're a guard. I mean, yeah. let's face it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your two guards, I, not just two, but, but the two who came in last year, yeah. um, you know, Caleb and RJ, those, those are the key to this team in a way, aren't they? They really are. And uh, it's, it's so much nicer to have sophomore guards than freshman guards. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hey, they're still they're still technically freshmen, you know. You know, right. Exactly. 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 They are. But they're not playing like freshmen right now. And, you know, they understand the importance of taking care of the basketball. They understand getting everybody involved in uh, both Caleb and RJ. The difference between this year and last year is just dramatic. And, and you're right. It, it, it is the key. You know, uh, these two guys, uh, they're interchangeable. And I love playing two point guards out there on the floor at the same time because nobody can press you and nobody can take you out of your offense. And so you've got multiple playmakers that can make plays for themselves, but also make plays for their teammates. And um, the first, you know, two weeks of practice, they're doing that. They're getting everybody involved. They're taking care of the basketball. They're taking good shots. And you're, you're right. That's going to be the key. If, if, if we can get consistent, great play, guard play from RJ and, and Caleb and also from Kerwin, um, we're going to have a chance. But they're playing extremely well starting practice. You know, I know this is like a loaded question, obviously, expectations yeah. for this year. I yeah. mean, expectations around there, they're always high. I mean, they are. You know, I feel like every year it's, you know, understood it's like Final Four. Yep. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. I mean, it, oh no, it, it's, no, it's uh, ACC regular season, ACC tournament, Final Four, and national championship. So every year, that's our goal. Plain and simple, period. The end. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Most, <laughs> well, most guys give me coach speak. No, it is. It is our goal, you know. But you know, one of the things that we focus on all the time is the preparation in the process. And so if you don't take care of the pre preparation in the process, all those goals, you, you got no chance of happening. And so um, the thing that we focus on is let's give ourselves a chance by the way that we prepare, by the way that we practice, and by the way that we play every day, let's give us a chance to be able to achieve all of those goals. And that's, that's what we talk about. What's the key to this team? You know, again, uh, fighting for that ACC regular season title. And then we know once you get in the tournament, anything can happen. So it can, it can, you know, one of the things that I've, I've noticed, there is a um, sense of desperation, uh, motivation with the guys on the team. They, they, they're desperate to, uh, to be relevant. They want to be heard and they want to be seen um, in, in a good way. They're tired of hearing about our stories our testimonies, our memories of playing in big games, being in big moments and winning championships. They want their own stories. They want their own testimony. They want their own memories of them playing in big games, winning big games and winning championships. And not one time, not one drill, not one second have I ever had to coach effort with these guys since I've become head coach. And I really believe that there's a determination there's a fire inside of them um, to be relevant. And it's, it's, it's fun to see and it's fun to coach. Yeah, listen, I mean, you have, you have the pieces back for the most part, right? I mean, you, you, you know you have it. You know you – with those three transfers, and you just got to get Brady's, Brady's confidence. I, I felt like that was the biggest thing with him last year at Oklahoma. You know, obviously the COVID year affected him a lot personally. It did. You got to get his confidence back because, like you said – I mean, there aren't many better shooting bigs in the country than Brady Manick. There, there, there isn't. I, I don't know fully um, um, all the information, but I, I feel like he, you know, he was he was on fire last year, and then he got COVID. Then he got hurt at Baylor, and then from that point on, it took him a little bit to get back to rhythm. He really didn't get back to bring, being the normal Brady Manick, probably to the NCAA tournament. But you're right. Uh, he's got his confidence back. Uh, he's uh, he's shooting the ball really well. And the thing that uh, that I didn't know was that he's an unbelievable passer, you know, and he's just it makes a difference when you have an experienced player. That's another thing about the transfer portal and why it's so valuable as good a freshman. You know, you, you can get the number one guy in the country. Compare that to a junior or a senior that's played in the ACC or Big Ten or Pac-12, you know, that's that, that's a big difference. <laughs> that's a big difference. Everybody wants to be old. They want Everybody to be Everybody wants to be old right now. You watch what Villanova did, what you guys did a few years ago. Yes. I mean, yeah. probably a good mix is what everybody's looking for, right? You're looking for a good mix, exactly. You're looking for a combination because I, you know uh, – I think that's I think that's the winning formula yeah. is is yeah. is to have a combination of talented youth, but also talented experience. And that's what we're looking for. And I think that's what everybody's looking for. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, appreciate you taking a few minutes mm -hmm. and uh, congrats. Thank Good you. Good luck. So and and uh, can't wait to see you that that seat over one seat over. It's going to give you some more gray hair. Yeah. It's going to give me some more gray hair. <laughs> it definitely is, but it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Hubert. We'll talk yeah. soon and, uh, and congrats. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money with their rush pay instant approval withdrawing your winnings is safer it's more secure and it's more reliable now that basketball season is tipping off get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the bet rivers ios app you must be 21 years or older if you have a gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER and while i got you here let's talk about the field of 68 media network where college basketball matters most 
all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the program that they love the most. AJ Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins and North Carolina's Shimon Williams and Michigan's Stu Douglas and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. That was North Carolina head coach Hubert Davis with our Jeff Goodman. And now I have joining me C.L. Brown from the Rally News and Observer, a longtime beat writer for North Carolina sports, and Carter Elliott of Sleepers Media and the Unscripted Podcast. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Doing good. Doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. So I, I think the biggest news, I mean, there's there's a lot of things going on with this North Carolina program, but I think the biggest news is they were able to get Puff Johnson coming back. I want to know what you guys think about his impact, <laughs> what kind of player he's going to end up being this season. I mean, it's Puff. He's back, right? Well, he's all nicknamed for, for Carolina's purposes, <laughs> and he's got the he's got the pedigree. Um, <laughs> so actually, and, and I all- would like to see him get on the court, you know, just to he he was basically unhealthy most of last year. He only got even, even though his role was going to be limited, he only got a couple of appearances. So I, I like to see him get a shot, man. Yeah. Hey, we need to have a North Carolina team with a leaky and a puff on. I I just think gotcha. they, uh, we need definitely, that kind of karma. They, they definitely got, they, North Carolina definitely has the names down. They got some great names on this roster. Now it's just trying <laughs> to make it happen on the court. All right. In all seriousness, uh, Roy Williams is gone. Hubert Davis is now running this program. And, and see, I'm curious, you're kind of embedded down there. So when did you get wind of the fact that this might be something where Roy Williams is going to announce his retirement? Because I remember it happened on the morning of April Fool's Day. April it Fool's happened. Day, I was, yeah. like, I was like, no, nah, this ain't real. Like, why, why? You guys are all falling for Roy Williams announcing his retirement. You idiots. This is not. <laughs> Were you surprised when it happened? And, and did you kind of get word of it beforehand? No, they, they he kept it tight, man. Really, the only people that knew about it it was Roy Williams. It was the athletic director, Bubba Cunningham. Um, it was the chancellor of the school. And Hubert came in at the tail end of it when, you know, because initially Roy maybe did it two weeks before the announcement. And the chancellor wanted him to think about it, obviously, because <laughs> that was going to be a big change. And so, uh, you know, he, he took some more time, but it really didn't move him. And I mean, I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised, if that makes sense, just because I think COVID, man, the pandemic took a toll on everybody in just kind of in different ways. And and I don't think it was so much the changes in college basketball, you know, um, uh, with the NIL about the, at that point about to be launched and, and about to be real and the transport portal and things like that. I mean, I, I think I think Roy would have handled that had it been kind of normal. <laughs> we had a sense of normalcy, but not being able to connect with his players the way he would have liked, not having, you know, that that freshman class, which it was a huge freshman class to be coming in and really depending on them last year and to not be able to connect with them during the summer and, and early in the fall before practice started. Um, I think that I think all of that factored into the kind of season they had. So um, uh, at the end of the day, yes, yes, I was surprised. But um, when Hubert ended up being his, named his successor, I wasn't surprised at that at all, because I think that's what Roy wanted from nine years ago when he initially hired Hubert as an assistant. Yeah. So the pandemic made Roy Williams not want to coach basketball anymore. It made CL Brown not want to wear suits anymore. He's not, <laughs> not officially Carter. I, I maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I think that it's really interesting that the guys that North Carolina lost were, were kind of big, big fellas, right? Like real big guys, throwback, big guys, Dayron Sharp, uh, Walker Kessler, Garrison Brooks, and the front court players they brought in to replace them were a little bit more perimeter oriented. A guy like a Dawson Garcia, we got Brady Manick coming in. So, are you expecting I, – I know it kind of goes against what Roy Williams did. Like he wanted those two bigs, crash the glass, go get every single rebound, right? But it feels like there might be a little bit of a more modern 
kind of roster and a modern kind of team for North Carolina this year? Am I reading too much into that, you think? No, I think that that's exactly what it is. When Hubert got the job, I think he immediately got to work uh, with getting in the transfer portal and getting players that kind of fit the more new style of basketball with the one big man in the middle and four outside with guys who can shoot and drive. Uh, last year, North Carolina was the, the best rebounding team offensively in the country the whole year. Um, and that's beating out likes of teams like Houston who are crashing the gas. So they had big men on the floor, too, at minimum at all times. Now you're kind of seeing where they might, might have a situation where it's Baycott in the middle this year. And then you have guards, wings around him. And then you have a versatile kind of modern day four man like a like a Dawson Garcia who can shoot it, but also do inside out. So I think that Huber did a great job of constructing this team and kind of changing what it's going to look like, especially on the offensive end this year. So my hottest take, CEO, is that I think Caleb Love is going to be an All-American this season. I think that if it wasn't for Paolo Bancaro being right down the road in Durham, I think that he would be my pick for ACC Player of the Year. And the reason I say that is... I'm glad you said that. Because <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm in the same boat, yeah. He's, he's going to have space this year. Like, the biggest issue they had last season was they didn't have shooting and he had nowhere to drive. And he's not a guy that's going to kind of beat you from the perimeter, right? He needs to get into the lane and make something happen. And there was no space for him to get into the lane. This year, Kerwin Walton is back. R.J. Davis is going to be a sophomore. They got Brady Manick coming in who can make shots. They got Darson Garcia coming in who can make shots. They got the uh, – uh, I'm blanking on this. Uh, DeMarco Dunn coming in, who I've heard is, has had a pretty good uh, summer and fall. Dontre so, Styles looked really good in uh, shooting yeah. the ball. So they, they got guys that can create that space for him to get into the lane. And he's had a full offseason to kind of learn what a point guard needs to do in that uh, North Carolina offense, that secondary break offense. Maybe it's the, the, the people are going to look a little bit different, but I don't think that the offense is going to look all that different for what North Carolina does. So uh, t- talk to me about him, man. You're, you're down there. Talk to me about Caleb Love. Tell me why I'm so smart for having to be an All-American this season. Man, my, my chips are all in on Caleb Love. And I think what hurt him, as well as the rest of the freshmen, um, not just here, but all over the country, any teams like Duke and Kentucky that were depending on a huge freshman class because of COVID, because they weren't able to get in there in the summer and kind of learn the system and play with guys and, and get a feel. I mean, that's why I felt like Caleb's turnover rate was so high. You know, mm-hmm. he just he missed all of that time, you know, that he, he wasn't able to kind of get acclimated and um, uh, I wholeheartedly believe that with this lineup of shooters. Now you can take this with a grain of salt because it was the equivalent of the the blue white game the other night, Friday night when they did late night with, uh, with Hubert Davis, uh, their midnight madness equivalent. Um, Seven different players hit three pointers. I don't know that last year's roster, (laughs) they had seven guys who could, who could during the course of a game, make the three. So um, I, I think the Caleb love that we saw, when he had his quote unquote vendetta games against Duke last year, <laughs> where, where, you know, that was coming out of high school. That was the school he wanted to go to initially. Uh, and obviously they didn't take him. Um, I think the way he played in those games is what we're going to see the entire season from him. He's, he's, I think he's going to be a killer. Huber Davis even said he felt like, uh, uh, Caleb is going to lead the league in free throw attempts because of, as you said, he's going to, he's going to be driving to the basket. He's going to be getting fouled. He's going to be an aggressor. So I just looked it up. North Carolina last season had seven guys that made more than just one, three all last year. One of those guys went four for 16 and that was Anthony Harris. So uh, it's very clear to me that they have better shooting and the numbers kind of yes. uh, portray that out. What are you expecting out of Caleb love um, to Carter and, and, at least I'm really excited to see what you can do if you put him on the floor with RJ Davis. Cause I feel like Roy's best teams have kind of had those two playmakers in the backcourt together, whether it was Joel Berry and Nate Britt or Joel Berry and Marcus page um, kind of at least recently. Yeah. I, I think that Caleb love, I'm all in on Caleb love too. I don't know if I'm going with the whole all American way that you're taking it, but I'm all in on Caleb love having a bounce back here. Like CL said, he was basically handed the keys to a team as a freshman point guard without basically any type of summer work, any type of things with his team and was told to run a team where really they didn't have any spacing. Like Caleb love has the ability to get to the rim 
And I think that he'll have a serviceable enough jumper this year as well to keep the defense honest. But him with space and being able to kick the dudes like R.J. Davis and Kerwin Walden, I think are only going to make him so much better. And then he can also throw it to Baycott, who on the block is a beast and can score the ball with his right or left hand. So I really am all in on Caleb Love for a breakout this year. And also, I really like what I saw from Justin McCoy as well, the transfer from Virginia. If I'm Virginia fans, they're probably punching air right now because they lost Justin McCoy. I think he can be a versatile front court player. And they just have so many pieces that you can plug into this team. You have a guy like Brady Manick who was getting buckets in the Big 12. You know, the brick from French Lick is what I like to call him, but he shoots it pretty well from time to time. But so they they got a good team. They got the things in place this year, but it, a lot is going to come with Caleb Love taking that sophomore year jump and showing, you know, the country why he was a McDonald's All-American and so highly taught out, highly sought after coming out of high school. See, what have you heard about some of the freshmen? Uh, I'm sorry, some of the transfers, um, Dawson Garcia, Brady Manick, Justin McCoy, who's been impressive, uh, who's looked good. Um, and, and what have you seen out of those guys? Yeah. Um, so I think the thing that they needed a lot of last year that they didn't have, you just mentioned Justin McCoy. Uh, one of the things Armando Baycott was talking about um, in some of our availability earlier was the intensity level that Justin McCoy has brought defensively. And obviously, if you play at Virginia, that's going to be a part of what you do. And <laughs> and let's be honest, at North Carolina, that hasn't been what has defined uh, Roy Williams teams in the past. You know, you don't come away saying, oh, that's a great defensive team or, or even great defensive players necessarily. So uh, I, I do think under Hubert, it's, it's going to be a little bit different defensively, too. I think that's going to be more of a point of emphasis where they're not just trying to outscore teams, you know, with the pace and, and uh, just their offensive explosive ability. I think Justin McCoy is going to bring a, a, a defensive presence that's going to help elevate everybody else. Um, Brady Manick, as you said, they, <laughs> they believe in him as a shooter. And I think that's obviously half the battle when you're throwing to somebody and you feel like he's going to make it every time. Um, and, and there's some comparisons being thrown around very loosely. Uh, obviously he's, he's taller than, than Luke may was, but Luke was that stretch four that, you know, Carolina really hadn't had in a long time, you know, when, when, uh, when he kind of burst onto the scene in that 2017, uh, national championship team, making the, making a big shot to beat Kentucky in the elite eight and, um, and Dawson Garcia, I mean, that's somebody he probably wouldn't have left Marquette had had Wojo not been fired, uh, Steve Wojciechowski not been fired. Um, but Carolina had recruited him as a freshman. They really wanted him. You know, it, it was just kind of how the chips fell and, and Walker Kessler committing and everything like that kind of uh, pushed our Dawson Garcia out. But, you know, they're they're excited about his his ability, his in, inside and out ability to play um, mainly about that, that ability to step outside and, and hit threes because Hubert Davis as a player was a shooter and that's how he wants his roster. He wants a lot of guys that can shoot the ball because of that spacing and because of uh, the versatility uh, it, it will allow their offense. So Carter, let me if, you're, if you're saying Brady man is going to be Luke may, I might have to go, uh, I might have to go put a place of bed in on North Carolina win it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Carter, let me ask you this. You're a big guy, right? Armando Baycott is a big guy. What do you expect me out of him this season? I've seen some people project him as like a, a first team ACC kind of a player this year. I'm not quite there myself, but I also know that down the stretch of last season, he probably played his best basketball in March. What do you, what do you expect now of the big fella? I expect him to work, work well as, you know, like I mentioned with Caleb Love, having space works for big men as well. Uh, not having the ability to have the lane clogged, I think is going to work really well for him. Um, I think my biggest thing with him this year is that he doesn't become one of those players who takes the NBA feedback and kind of tries to have a year where he's proven what he can do to play at the NBA level. I've mentioned it with other people. You know, people try to say that Hunter Dickinson should get a right hand because he needs to use his right hand to play in the NBA, but he's really dominant with his left. Uh, Armando Baycott is a dominant force on the post. Uh, does he want to step out and shoot it for the next level and show his passing ability and things like that? Yes. But I think for his team, for North Carolina to be the best they can be and for him to be the best player he can be, he's got to go to what is, what is his bread and butter. And that's on the post, getting buckets with his left and right hand and rebounding the basketball. So I'm expecting him to have a big year. 
Uh, you know, he should just be able to do, kind of have a continuation of last year, but a little less, a little less, a uh, little more room to operate, a little less clogging in the pain, I think. Hey, Rob, if I, if I can jump, uh, jump in on the tail end of that, I, I think that's an excellent point um, in terms of Armando trying to showcase himself for the next level instead of necessarily trying to do what's right for this team. I think that'll be something to keep an eye on. He did step outside, make a three in the uh, in the, the blue-white game the other night, um, and that's something that Hubert Davis is going to allow him to take some of those shots because he talked about how hard he worked at it during the summer. But ultimately, I think for this team to be uh, to be in the upper echelon of, of teams in the nation, I think that he, his, his bread and butter is on the blocks. Um, and my one thing with Armando, keeping him from being great is Armando. Like, I, I think there are a couple of times last year where he just disappeared. I mean, the first half of the Wisconsin loss in the NCAA tournament, he, he just kind of, he was just out there. He wasn't, he wasn't a presence at all. He didn't establish himself. And I remember the Clemson game, the loss at Clemson, um, where he was 0 for 1. Like, <laughs> he, there should never be a game where Armando was just taking one shot on last year's roster and, and this year's roster as well. So, uh, that's my thing with Armando. He, he, he has to be consistent this year. And I, I also think he has to be focused on what will make this team great. Not necessarily what's going to make his NBA stock rise. So we've made it this far to a conversation about North Carolina and we haven't mentioned the guy that I think could end up being the, uh, I guess maybe the senior leader on this team. It feels like he could be something similar to, to kind of what Theo Pinson was for the teams that made it to the final four and the, the won the national title for North Carolina in terms of, you know, he's probably the best perimeter defender that they have. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, he's a guy that can put the ball on the floor and make a pass and create for somebody else. He's kind of that like Swiss army knife, Jack of all trades that makes everything else fit. Although I don't know exactly where he fits himself on this roster. Does that make sense? So I'm, yeah. I'm very interested, Carter, to see how Hubert decides to use a guy like Leaky Day. Uh, Leaky yeah. yeah. The thing is like, when you mention a guy like Theo Penson, what I think about is a guy who completely bought into the fact that he was a Swiss army knife. Like he embraced the role of doing it all, bringing the, being that one like linchpin for the team to bring the team together from what I've seen, just, you know, watching over the years, I don't really think Leaky's really accepted the fact that he needs to be like a Swiss army knife, kind of a very good role player. I think he thinks he can be better than that. Um, and I don't blame him for that, but I think in order to make this North Carolina team kind of be the best it could be, he needs to buy into being that Swiss army knife. And that doesn't mean, you know, necessarily scoring all the points one night it means doing things on the defensive end all you know on the glass and also distributing the ball that he needs to so I think if he buys into the fact that he is a Swiss Army knife that would be really good for this North Carolina team and just be that be really good at doing that where are you at on the CL I think Leakey shouldn't really shoot on on this <laughs> roster they're gonna have enough shooters and and he can do I, trust me, I was president of the Leaky Black fan club as a freshman, and I thought he would project at this point he could be a star by his senior year. And I've had to kind of change that uh, based on what what he's done on the court. But he definitely A through Z, he can do it all. Um, I just think he has to be more more selective with his shot selection. To, to really fit it, because sometimes it's not necessarily that he's taking bad shots. It's it's that he hasn't consistently hit those shots. So it's not his shot. You know what I mean? Um, uh, he did have, you know, the big game last year that kind of helped them early in the season. I think it, it was either the Notre Dame or the Miami game. I'm, I'm getting them mixed up. It was it was the it was the Notre Dame game. Um, that was that was a confidence boost for him. He uh, had the game winning shot um, late in that game. And I just think that's not what his role is. He's a, he could be a great defender. He could really be a, a point guard when they need him to be and, and facilitate the offense because he, he has that good a court vision and, and uh, he can be a great passer for this team. But uh, I, I think he does a lot of things well. I just don't think he has consistently been a, a good enough shooter to where – and on this team, they're going to have more shooters to where that needs to be something that he's he's doing a lot of. All right, so coach, coach, coaches always say play your game, and that's perfect for Leaky. He just needs to play his game. He doesn't need to do. He doesn't need to create his own shot and shoot jump shots. That's not his game. He just needs to do, like you said, be great on the defensive end and even distribute the ball. Just knowing your role and playing your role is 
is essential to being a good basketball team. Is there anyone that we missed? We, we haven't really talked about Anthony Harris, who's coming back. What did he? I think it was an ACL, right? We haven't really talked yeah. about the yeah. too much. Um, is there anyone else, CL, that we're kind of that, that we should mention, or that that you think is going to have a big? Well, game? I mean, I, I think RJ for sure. I mean, we we kind of mentioned him, but didn't dive deep. But RJ Davis, I think, is is Joel Berry 2.0 <laughs> reincarnated. He he might not be as as physical necessarily as as uh, Barry could be at times, but I, I think they're both, you know, uh, smallish point guards who aren't afraid to take it inside, who can make big shots, who can, you know, kind of give you that offensive burst. And and he has a toughness about him. And, and when Barry came to the team, I think that was something that they lacked at that time. And also think um, this team does – hasn't really shown that toughness. And I think RJ brings a a certain amount of toughness to this team. Yeah. I feel like we love those guys at North Carolina that are kind of the, the smaller shoot first score first player. I know that RJ is not necessarily the same kind of caliber as someone like a Ty Lawson or someone like a Ray Felton. And I don't know if he'll ever reach Joel Berry's level. Uh, I mean, Joel Berry made it to -to back-to-back national title games, won a title was an all American, Uh, but it's that same kind of, mold i feel like which which kind of makes a lot of sense well anyways let's let's wrap it up with this uh 30 seconds real quick carter what, what are your level of expectation for north carolina and what would you call a um a successful season same thing for ucl uh, i think they need to compete for the acc title um i know a lot of people are putting florida state above them and maybe even virginia too but i think at worst they should be the second best team in this conference and they should be a serious challenger to Duke to win the win the regular season title. I think they have the talent. I think that Hubert set it up where they can they be in the, put in the best position to win. And I like the whole one big new style of basketball thing that they're kind of taking the mold of. So I think that a top two finish and maybe even a title should be what the expectation for this team would be for the ACC. Well, I, I actually picked them to finish second in the in the ACC. I, I think that. Um, Hubert Davis isn't going to have a, a, a big learning curve like some people may may suggest since he's coming into, you know, obviously a high profile position with no co- head coaching experience uh, outside of the Carolina JV team, which 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 I think counts for something because he's been in position of a game where he's making decisions that factor in to winning and losing. But, um, yeah, I, I think this team can compete for the ACC title. Uh, I think a sweet 16 appearance for this team would be, would be um, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I think it's something that, that they should, should be able to achieve. And, and you know, who knows from there um, I'm not necessarily putting this team in a national title uh, or final four kind of frame, but I, I think they will be uh, a competitive bunch, a top, top 15, top 20 team uh, throughout the season. And I, I think, uh, I think it'll be fun just kind of usher in this new era of North Carolina basketball with this team, because I, I think the differences that we're going to see in, in kind of the modernization, if you will, of, of uh, Hubert Davis' systems is, is going to be different from what Carolina fans have, have expected over the Roy Williams tenure. Well, I, I don't think that they're a lock for the final four by any stretch. And I don't think that I would call them a title favorite, but I do see, uh, ways that it can kind of work out for North Carolina to get to that level. I would pick Duke to win the ACC. I could see North Carolina winning the ACC if Caleb Love ends up being as good as I expect him to be. And I think that the the level of success that they kind of have this season depends on how effective he can be and how effective he is. I think kind of depends on how well those shooters kind of space the floor. So it all kind of works together. But I do think that there is a very high ceiling for this uh, North Carolina team. Anyway, Carter, uh, CL, I appreciate you, appreciate you guys being here. This was fun to do. Um, and hopefully uh, we, we end up seeing Caleb Love on that first team All-American team at the end of the season. Make us all look smart, right? <laughs> no doubt. Thanks for having me, Rob.